evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Tamara Warren, and I am appointee for the City of Columbia's Climate Protection Action Committee, or CPAC, and we welcome you to our quarterly event. So this month, we're going to be talking about climate protection and environmental issues through the lens of education. So we welcome you back to school sustainability style. Tonight, we're gonna to hear from educators as well as students as they give their perspective on climate and environmental issues, as well as provide various resources that could be available to both educators, students, and the general public. So the first person that we're gonna be talking to is Ms. Jane Hiller. She's a legend in the city of Columbia and around the state for the work that she does in environmental education, but she's going to be sharing information about two different initiatives. First, we have the Environmental, um, I'm sorry, the Environmental Education Association of South Carolina, which is EEASC, as well as the Green Steps Program. So Ms. Jane Hiller, please take it away. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to be part of this. So uh, I guess the way you get to be a legend is you just hang around a long time. So uh, I've been here uh, quite a while. All right. So as Tamara said, we're going to uh, talk about EEASC and Green Steps. So I'm going to start with EEASC. Let's see if I can get my screen to show here. OK. So um, EESC has been around for 44 years, um, and we have been working with um, educators in order to um, encourage people to learn about taking better care of the environment. So um, we are a not-for-profit affiliate of a national organization for environmental education and also a, a state affiliate of uh, the Southeastern Environmental Education Alliance. So we are, our, our group is representing uh, South Carolina, uh, both in the region and nationally. Our vision is to motivate South Carolinians to interact sustainably with their environment. And so we take our mission statement uh, to work to connect support and equip our citizens to promote environmental stewardship. So what we try to do is be boots on the ground to help that happen. Environmental um, or EESC is for lots of people. It's for formal and non-formal environmental educators. That means classroom teachers and people like Mary Pat and I who uh, work outside the classroom uh, with teachers or with, with students. It's also for environmental communicators. Uh, some people don't actually do education per se, but they get the word out. And so we have a lot of environmental communicators uh, in our group. And it's also for any person, uh, organization or business who is just interested in environmental education. So um, if you're interested in environmental education, uh, we would welcome you at EEASC. Uh, the things we provide, we have a website, uh, keep everybody up to date on what's going on in environmental education in our state. We send out quarterly e-letters. We have regional and statewide lists, listservs that um, members can post things so we can all keep up on what everybody's doing. And um, we have many grants that are um, up to $1,000 for projects um, to do that. We have two major, uh, well, we have several major activities that we do during the year. First of all, uh, we have our annual June conference. Uh, we move that around the state. This year, it's going to be down in Aiken at the Savannah River environmental um, or ecology lab. Uh, we also do regional meetups, field studies, and community events. Here in the Midlands, we have a monthly meetup, um, and it's a round robin. So we would love to have any of you come and tell us what you're doing, and you can find out what other people are doing. We all go away pretty energized just seeing how many things are going on and how hard people are working um, on this. 
Um, we also do an annual Earth Day fundraiser to support uh, these activities. We have two major programs that we do. The first one is called PEAK, Palmetto Environmental Education Certification. And this is pretty new. Uh, for many, many years, South Carolina did not have a certification program. So uh, we are really excited about this. Uh, we, um, people sign up for a two-year uh, professional development course. Um, and at the end, they take a test uh, to become a certified environmental educator. The other big program is the South Carolina Green Step School Initiative, which is what I coordinate. And um, I'm going to go into detail about that in just a minute. So if you would like to uh, participate in EESC, you can just attend our activities. Everybody is welcome. You can join EESC as an individual, a family, or, or organization. You can ask to be part of the PEAK program or ask to uh, join Green Steps either as a classroom teacher, educator, or as a mentor who helps um, the schools. You can apply to be in our Speakers Bureau. Uh, and uh, this is uh, this is our big goal for this year. Uh, after 44 years, we think we're actually going to be able to afford to have a part-time paid administrator. Uh, we have always done, been all volunteer. So uh, we're looking for somebody um, who's, who's really passionate about this and uh, can help us out. And if you don't have time to actually uh, do our activities, uh, you can still support us by donating to our Earth Day fundraiser or becoming a sponsor for our uh, June conference. So if you're interested in EESC, you can find us at eesc.org. Um, all the information is on there. Or you can contact me directly at janehiller at gmail.com. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about the South Carolina Green Step Schools Initiative. Mary Pat and I actually worked on starting this way back in 2003. Um, our first group um, of awards went out in 2004, and schools have been uh, schools statewide have been working on this ever since. So it's designed to help K through 12 public and private schools and homeschool groups earn awards for establish, establishing sustainability projects where students learn, do, and teach others. So this is hands-on learning. And it is the goal is to for schools to establish programs that become part of their culture. This is not just do it once and be done. This is uh, figure out things that we can do in our schools that make our environment a better place. Our Green Step sponsors include EESC, South Carolina DHEC, and Sunoco Recycling, the company that I worked for for 24 years and just retired this summer. The projects that schools do fall into the categories of conserving, protecting, and restoring the environment. Under conserve, uh, some schools work on conserving energy. Uh, they work with uh, uh, South Carolina Energy Office, learning how to do an audit of their energy use and then take an action, something that can be done at their school to reduce their energy use. We also have a lot of schools doing simple, simple solar projects. The teacher here um, is holding a pizza box solar oven and kids uh, learn how uh, they can use the sun uh, to do uh, some things so we don't have to turn on the oven. A lot of schools do waste reduction projects, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Under protect, we have um, protecting our air quality. Uh, here is a picture of the anti-idling breathe better campaign that a lot of schools work on. Uh, children are learning about anti, 
uh, about the effects of idling and then teaching people that come on drive onto their school campus in cars or buses about uh, the benefits of turning off that engine when you're not in motion. Uh, we uh, schools also are working on a lot of water quality, different water quality projects. Here, students have um, made their own rain barrel and they're learning to use a soaker hose to take that water over to a um, pollinator garden that they are growing on their school campus. And a lot of schools do litter prevention projects. We put this under protecting water because where does litter end up? It ends up in our waterways. So uh, schools keep their own campus clean and a lot of schools reach out beyond their campus who adopt the spot, adopt the waterway, adopt the highway, depending on the age of the, of the children. These are elementary students here and they are picking up at a park uh, near their school, uh, but it's off of their campus. Restore projects uh, typically are restoring soil and restoring habitat. Uh, the restoring soil projects, a lot of times are composting projects. Uh, this is great science teaching kids the soil science and uh, they do indoor composting in their classrooms using red wiggler worms, best classroom pet. Uh, they also do outdoor composting uh, so that they can learn how to compost in their own backyards. Some schools also do uh, projects to prevent soil erosion um, under our soil projects. For habitat, um, we have lots of projects that help habitat for people and wildlife. Um, schools have many different kinds of gardens. Uh, they all count. They're also tree planting, um, that kind of stuff. So lots and lots of habitat things, but it can also be bee houses and bird houses and all different kinds of uh, projects for habitat. We have a whole list of mentors who help, uh, who are available to help schools in the city of Columbia. That includes City of Columbia Recycling and Sustainability. That Sam Yeager pictured there, uh, your recycling person. And you all know Mary Pat, she's on board. Clemson Extension, Keep the Midlands Beautiful, Richland County Soil and Water, uh, South Carolina Bureau of Air Quality, BNR, Energy Office, the Forestry Commission, and the Wildlife Federation. So all of these people are experts in a field and they are available to help teachers plan and carry out these kind of projects. The two that are in bold uh, type there are two that have won our uh, uh, best of the best mentors of uh, various years, and they are now in our Mentor Hall of Fame. Uh, local Green Step schools, um, over the years, we have had five schools in the City of Columbia participate. Uh, AC Moore, Cola City Homeschoolers, Columbia Montessori School, Columbia Islamic School, and St. Joseph Elementary. Over in Richland County, we have a longer list. Um, Condor Elementary, Dent Middle School, Dutch Fork Elementary, H.E. Corley, Harmony, Lake Carolina Elementary, St. John Newman, and Windsor Elementary. Um, as you can imagine, the last couple of years with COVID have been a challenge. And it has been a challenge not only in the classroom, but to do these extra kind of projects as well. So the schools that have an asterisk after their name are the ones that have managed be with all that's going on to keep their environmental projects going. The others are kind of on hold right now um, until things settle down a bit, which we totally understand. They asked me to highlight one school so you could see a little bit more in detail what that one school is doing. And the obvious uh, school to highlight was Dutch Fork Elementary Academy of Environmental Sciences. Some of their students do live in the city of Columbia. Some of them live in Richland County, depending on how the, how the boundaries work there. But um, this school has been uh, just a model uh, for this program. They are in our upper echelon uh, group of 
in, uh, Green Step schools. We call them our certified Green Step schools. And they have won every single one of our top awards as Conserve, Protect, Restore, and School of the Year uh, various years. Because of the great work that they have done, they were nominated to be um, for a national award, which they earned uh, the South Carolina, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, the National Green Ribbon Award. Just to show you the kinds of projects they do um, under reduce, reuse, and recycle. For reduce, they have something called a share table where unopened food does not go in the trash. It gets put back in on a table or in a cooler and gets uh, used since it didn't get used the first time. They also collect organics for commercial compost. And the pilot that they have been running for several years um, is now growing and going to be used in multiple schools um, in school district five uh, for reuse they have upcycled projects they do every year a shoe collection for people without shoes that's uh, run by keep the midlands beautiful they have an excellent recycling program collecting cardboard paper plastic bottles metal cans and they also collect plastic bags and film as part of a Trex challenge, um, and those get turned back into plastic lumber. They also do conserve projects. They've learned to do audits at their school and taken actions to uh, reduce energy use. They um, also have done several uh, easy solar projects like the pizza box ovens. Here in the picture, you can see solar, solar garden warmers. Uh, these are huts that they make out of PVC pipe and stack soda bottles. They're very light and the kids can pick them up and put them over raised beds when uh, frost is predicted to protect the tender plants underneath. Under protect projects, they do things like protecting air quality. They do the B2 anti-idling campaign every year with South Carolina DHEC. They do classroom plants uh, to help with indoor air quality, but they're also doing other things to help with indoor air quality, um, get good ventilation and things in their school. For protecting water quality, they have rain barrels. You can see one uh, pictured here. They also do a program with DNR called Trout in the Classroom, where they the children actually learn to uh, take care of little fingerling trout and raise them to um, over the year so that they are big enough to release into our local rivers. And they prevent litter uh, there on their campus. They restore their soil with different composting projects and they restore habitat with many garden projects, birds and bee houses and, and a nature trail. So you can see uh, they've got a lot going on. Those are not things that they do and then they stop. These are things they do and continue all at the same time. So it, it's, it's really um, um, remarkable to see what some of these schools are doing. If you would like to become a Green Step school or a mentor for a Green Step school, it's easy, it's fun, and it's rewarding. All you have to do is contact me, uh, janehiller at gmail.com. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Jane. Um, that was great information. And we hope that all of you out there will be interested in not only EEASC, but if you have your own children that are um, elementary school age or will be able to participate or their school can participate in the Green Steps program, then possibly sharing that information with those schools or educators. And so again, Thank you, Jane, and we will provide links for these resources towards the end of the webinar. So Jane provided information about what is actually taking place within our institutions. And so now we're going to hear from students that are actually doing the work. Um, there's a lot that is taking place outside of EEAs, EEASC and Green Steps, and some of that work is actually being done by our state organizations. And so in particular, we have the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control, which you commonly know as DHEC. They have a program which is called the Take Action SC 
which is a teacher's, uh, teacher's training. And what it does is that they have a new program called the Student Ambassadors for Sustainability. Um, this is being led by Ms. Amanda Edwards, as well as Angie Perry. And they're preparing our next generation of uh, educators, as well as those individuals that are gonna be out in the world doing climate protection, as well as helping to save the environment. And so they're preparing and helping them now. So what we're gonna do is take a look at a video video of this student ambassador program and you get to see exactly what the students are doing. And so get ready and uh, let's take a look at the actions that are taking place on the ground. Hey everyone, I'm Angie Perry and this is Amanda Edwards. <laughs> this was such a great opportunity for high school students to work with college students and learning and developing skills and all the things you see listed there, project management, public speaking, communication, leadership, and of course, tying all of those in with the sustainability project. And so we have a registration, had lots of students interested, then we paired them up to, um, you know, a college student. And it was really neat because the college students could be work with their own schedule, you know, they had different classes. What was really neat is something like at Spartanburg High School, as you can see here, um, they started a school garden and raised beds out behind their school. And they met as a class during their class time. So that was very neat. And um, so the, the couple of college students and actually one of the college students, Emmy, that you're going to hear from today, she she actually worked with the Spartanburg High School too. Um, but we had, as you can see, some of the different projects we had here, an environmental newsletter, composting started at their school. Um, and remember, and we are going to talk about this at the end, about grants. So some of these schools applied for a grant as with the school and received that to start the composting. Um, so that was really neat to see that also happening. Then we had the, today we're going to hear about the art contest. I don't want to steal any thunder from that because we also have the two high school students on here to talk about that as well. Um, as you can see, we had a garden tower to donate all the produce that was that came from that garden tower. Um, and then just different environmental, JL Mann High School, their environmental club did a big uh, environmental awareness week. So they did constantly things just to bring up their, they're already doing lots of great programs there, but they wanted to get all of their students involved in it. So as you can see, lots of great projects, very excited about moving forward with this program um, and continuing that partnership with the University of South Carolina. But right now I wanna to introduce to you Emmy, who um, was awesome to work with. She was a student mentor for the two high school students that you will hear from who were from JL Mann. And um, I just cannot say enough great things about Emmy, but I'm gonna let her talk about um, the Sustainable Carolina program and then her involvement in our program with the ambassadors. Hi everyone. Um, so as Angie said, my name is Emmy and I'm going into my senior year at the University of South Carolina. I'm studying environmental studies and psychology and I joined Sustainable Carolina as a sophomore. So I've been a part of it for a good few years now and I've really, really enjoyed the experience. Um, I love being able to work with the Office of Sustainability and really promote sustainability across our campus at USC and have now being a part of our K through 12 team, really been able to expand this across the whole Columbia community and even further than that. So I do serve as a peer leader. So as Grace explained, with my position as a peer leader, I do have a certain amount of requirements to meet. Um, so I'm not, I'm not just a volunteer, but with that, I do complete a certain amount of hours, so I give back to the community with these volunteer hours, and I do meet with a coach one-on-one, -on -one, which has been super beneficial to me. Um, she's been giving me a lot of great experience. It is a grad student who helps me get into the field. Um, I want to get into environmental career after I graduate from college, um, so she's been a great help and resource for that. I do also attend professional development meetings. So that's roughly about once a month. And those have been really beneficial as well to getting me prepared and getting that experience that I really look forward to. Um, another requirement is to graduate with leadership distinction, which is going to be something that I'm working on this upcoming fall semester. And it is 
a great experience as well to get you prepared um, and show all that you have achieved throughout your time in college. Um, I have specifically been working with the K through 12 team since my junior year. So I started that in the fall of my junior year and have done it for the past two semesters. And we'll do that again in this upcoming fall. And I have worked with Take Action SC and the Student Ambassador Program for Sustainability this past semester. And as well as before, we started everything off really right at the beginning of November in, I guess that would be 2019. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, so as Angie was mentioning, I was a part of two different projects. So I was the university student helping out with two projects. Um, the one that I did with the Spartanburg High School, I had another university student me, student helping me because um, that was a whole class that we were working with. Um, but specifically, I did also work with Maya and Maywin, who you guys will meet very shortly on their project. Um, but my role essentially was to help these high school students and make sure that they had everything set and were prepared for or whatever their project was that they were working on. So one way we specifically did this was by establishing a project management plan. And we set this up with the high school students back around in November when we were starting the um, trial run, or not trial run, excuse me, starting the program right away. And so this PMP plan, so that project management plan, kind of has a few essential aspects. And the first one is to establish goals. So with that, it's to go into detail about what specifically you are wanting to achieve. And so with the group that's going to present in just a little bit, they wanted to do that big sustainable art contest. And so that was a big goal. And we had to establish all those little goals in between. And so that's where you get into the brainstorm, the steps that are needed in order to achieve that goal. And that was really started off at the beginning. We started brainstorming what they wanted to get done, how they were going to do this, and really what needed to get achieved first. And so this is where you produce a task with deadlines, um, this list, so that way you can go back and see really what you would like to get done at what time. Um, for the girls that are going to present, we wanted to do their art contest on Earth Day. So April 22nd, I think I believe it was this past year, was the date that we were having to have everything finished by. So we set kind of these deadlines prior to that to figure out, okay, how many months would we need before this? How many weeks, whatever it was in between. And then we did arrange this chronologically so that it was in a step-by-step -step format so that you could kind of check it off as you went along. I mean, of course, plans change, things adapt as you go into it. So we did continuously review and update this plan and we had a note sheet so that we could see where things were changing and how things were updating as we went. In this position, again, being a, the university student for these high schoolers, it was really important to help make sure that the students were organized throughout this whole process and have the material and information that they required. Um, so a few ways that I did this in my role um, was that we did set up monthly meetings. So we'd plan these monthly meetings and while we were on the Zoom call, I would always be taking notes to make sure that the girls, whatever they were saying, or with the high school, Spartanburg High School, whatever the um, teacher was saying and the students were working on, we had those notes down so we were prepared to reflect on it afterwards. And then uh, send out reminder emails. So after every single um, meeting that we had, I would send an email just kind of taking the notes that we, um, we talked about in the meeting, shrinking them in a little bit so that it was the big, most important parts that we discussed. So making sure everyone was on the same page and then sending that a reminder email about any upcoming tasks that we had. So if there was something that needed to get done based off of that deadline, as well as a reminder for any upcoming meeting that we had scheduled, because again, it was usually about once a month. And then finally, I was just really there to be available if they had any questions throughout the entire process. Um, with the group that is gonna present, it was really from November until April was when we were working, or end of April. So throughout that entire time, if there was anything that they needed, I gave them my contact information and the girls were able to reach out with any anything that they had going on. Um, that really is my role and what I was doing as the university student for Take Action SC and the Student Ambassador Program. Um, I really am excited to hear from Maya and Maywin. So they're gonna go ahead and present right now on what they did with their specific task or their job within um, the Take Action SC student program. Thank you, everyone. So the next um, two guests I want to introduce is Maya and Mywin, and they have been great to work with as well. They made a perfect team with Emmy 
they're going to talk to you about how they were inspired to do their sustainable art contest, everything that they did, um, and I, be prepared to be impressed, just as you probably were with Emmy. Hey guys, I'm Maya. And I'm Awen. And we're gonna be seniors at JL Man High School this year. So our project began, we were inspired to promote sustainability in our own community. And this all starts with reusing, reducing and recycling. So we thought it'd be fun to have a virtual art contest where you can only use reused, recycled and old materials that would otherwise be thrown away. This not only encourages sustainability but also inspires creativity. The first thing we had to do for our contest was set some guidelines. These included using at least three different recycled or reused materials to create an original art piece. And this is without using any kind of new materials. We also set three different age groups for our submissions, which were ages zero to four, five to eight, and nine to 12. And since our contest was completely virtual, we had to design a website. And for this, we used Google Sites, which was extremely user-friendly and we inserted Google Forms for our registration, submission, and voting. And in order to promote the contest, we had to design a flyer as well. And for this, we used Canva, which was just as simple. And we even included a QR code for the website on the flyer. Next slide, thank you. <laughs> to promote our contest, we had to print off flyers and we took them to neighborhoods and local businesses. And we even contacted a local school that in that focuses on environmental sciences. And we also um, had the flyer virtually and we promoted that on social media. Um, another way that really helped us promote it was the Been Thinking April newsletter. And Jane Hiller helped us get a page in that newsletter, which helped us get kids from all over the state. Um, and it, it went to teachers from all over the state. So that really helped. To find judges and prizes, um, we went to local businesses and leaders and teachers, um, especially art teachers. They helped us for the art portion of it. Um, some of the prizes we acquired were Target gift cards, um, gift baskets, um, like newspaper pencils, and those were all very generously donated. Next slide. Then after our judges scored the submissions, we had a Zoom award show on Earth Day. And we recognized all the winners and then we also recognized some other special pieces that really stood out to us. It was amazing to see all the art pieces and the best part was knowing that we got to inspire the kids being sustainable. <laughs> we are planning on continuing this project again this year. And some of the changes we'll do are expanding the age groups and probably taking out the youngest age group because we didn't really have any submissions. And we'll also use some more marketing skills and communication skills that we learned along the way. Um, now we're gonna take a two minute break. So one of the things I wanted to finalize right before we take that two minute break, thank you all to you all three you guys were great and i hope everyone learned more about the program again that registration for the program will be on the takeactionsc.org website and it will open soon and we will probably have that registration until about september 15th so we want to get that in um, encourage your students your high school students to get that in so we can pair them with a university of south carolina mentor um, one of the things I forgot to mention, and I wanted to say it, is University of South Carolina was so great, too. Uh, one of the hopes of the programs was to bring all the student ambassadors onto the University of South Carolina campus, which we were, even with everything that was going on, University of South Carolina really worked hard to make that happen. And we invited the ambassadors, all of them, of course, but the ones that could come came and they were able to do a tour. And actually, Emmy, believe it or not, she does tours as well. She was able to lead them in the uh, South Carolina tour and of the campus.
campus and then we were actually able to do grace gave them a tour um, among others on her staff gave a tour of their sustainability programs their gardens composting recycling everything that they did um, they do at south carolina so we appreciate university of south carolina really working hard to make that happen and that would be something um, you know, uh, moving forward, we'd like to offer those ambassador students every year, not to mention that they all received a t-shirt that uh, Chris showed you earlier, the green one with, with the, the shirt that was made out of the plastic bottle, recycled bottles with the cool message on the back. Um, and they also received like a reusable straw kit. So that kind of kicked off the program. Um, and then final, last but not least, I want to thank Larry Cook because he's the director of the University of South Carolina Sustainable Carolina Program. And without him having the foresight and us working together to make all this happen, it, it wouldn't have happened. So thanks, Larry. And um, we look forward to another great year of the Sustainable um, Ambassador Program. <laughs>
I can start off. Uh, right now, I have Dr. Warren currently for environmental science. So like, of course, you'll talk about climate change. Um, also, I'm also taking an anthropology class called Latin American Cultures. Right now, we're reading a book called There Is No More Haiti by anthropologist Greg Beckett. And it really talks about the whole entire forest and the climate in Haiti right now, because there's a whole entire deforestation since everyone in Haiti, they chop down all their trees, they get charcoal. So from that perspective, from us reading so far, like the first two chapters of the book, it really shows firsthand like how the environment basically kind of started the downfall downfall of Haiti since like there was no more environment started all these other problems and I just find it really interesting because we talk about like the chopping down the trees and how it's currently getting hotter down in Haiti and how like the people down there don't have as much money so they don't have that much available resources to help combat against climate change. Okay awesome. Um, I can go next so um, I also have Dr. Warren of course um, she's really great at talking about climate change. Um, and that's the only class that I really had that have discussed about climate change, which I wish I could like take more classes to learn about it. Um, but that's only like, this is my first time taking environment science. So it's kind of, you know, interesting. Okay, that's cool. I think that the marine science program here at USC does a really great job of threading climate change throughout all of the core classes that we took. Um, and then Cameron and I had the opportunity to take a marine science elective course with Dr. Z. And um, obviously the whole class was about climate change, but an activity that really stuck out to me was she had us take a super science-y concept and we could only use the most common 100 English words to describe the concept. So really making the information digestible to others and focusing on that like climate change communication piece and how to actually um, talk to others about the concept was really cool. Yeah, I can definitely uh, agree with that. That was a very good class and actually got me into um, why I wanted to do the next, my master's degree in the first place. Um, she introduced me to carbon capture and storage, which is what I went and did my master's in. Um, I think from a marine science standpoint at USC, it was very much learning to quantify climate change. What are the impacts? where, how much, um, and certainly at maybe the next degree. And what was introduced to me in Dr. Z's class was about uh, programs, uh, policies, and more of a macro scale rather than just purely quantifiable science, what's kind of more holistic approach to all climate change and what are the steps being taken from a, a local regional scale to more macro scale for combating it. Okay. And so all of these are very interesting um, uh, viewpoints. And I, I kind of take it back to what Lou's kind of brought to the light is that this has probably been one of the, her environmental science class is probably the first time that she's maybe had this conversation as opposed to like Cameron and Alexis being in a marine science major, that really is a part of the discussion. And so I am curious when you think about your peers as millennials and Gen Z, how do you think the overall conversation about climate change or protection is having is, is taking place, especially if you have those individuals who may not necessarily have courses um, that are environmentally related or they may not be in the environmental fields? And so do you see this being hit or this conversation being had in the news, in the media, amongst yourselves? Are you having these conversations like where is this language really taking place? Um, to go off your question, Dr. Warren, um, I grew up in North Myrtle Beach my whole entire life, so I always grew up by a coastal city, so I always grew up surrounded by people that were, like, environmentally progressive, even, like, our whole entire town, everyone I went to school with, we were always talking about climate change and, like, how we have to keep, like, the environment going, because we see the effect firsthand with our oceans and if more hurricanes every single year. We see it firsthand living at, like, a coastal city. And then coming from Myrtle Beach to Columbia, um, I see it's very different with my peers because everyone comes from different cities. So like, especially here in Columbia, uh, I have friends that lived here all their life. They really don't know too much about like um, the environment as it is because they said they weren't as educated like I was when it came to environment or they really didn't care about climate change because some, to put it in perspective, some people just didn't have the education to like learn about it like I did or like some of them are just really selfish. I have come across people in my class, I'm like, 
well, it doesn't bother me. Like, it's not going to happen to me right now, so I won't care about it. So it's just different to see the different perspectives all across campus. Um, yeah, I think the same. Uh, my peers, I don't think they understand, like, the importance of climate change. And I think it's because they're, like, so lost in the technology world that they, they think technology is going to fix it all, but it really won't. So, like, they don't really dip into climate change. Like, my friends, they know what they heard of climate change, but they don't really know, like, what are the effects or how can we fix this. So, yeah. I think there definitely is a... There can be a lot of pessimism around, especially Gen Z and millennials, around climate change. And I think that might be a fact of media consumption, might be a fact of it's it, it's majority of what they hear. And to be honest, that might be a failing on the part of science communication, of understanding all the victories that's happening. What are the steps being taken? What are different pathways uh, from the IPCC, which have been outlined? And what are steps different countries are uh, committing to as far as their climate targets? Um, I think it, it, you see something like a hurricane um, and a natural disaster is hitting and like, okay, that's the climate change in order. Uh, it's, that's us, we're in the bins. But I think there's a lot to be optimistic about. And I think a bit more of the communication of the good side of climate change um, research and mitigation, I think would go a long way. And I think it's so interesting too, because a lot of millennials, when we were in school, we were kind of taught both sides. So like, we're gonna give you both sides of the argument. Um, these are the climate deniers and these are the people for climate change. And I, I believe that's still pretty much taught um, in a lot of schools today as well. And so a lot of people kind of have that duality that they're thinking of, um, but I would definitely agree with Cam that there's definitely a doom and gloom um, aspect to it and that people can get really trapped in spiraling thoughts about, okay, well, we have all these issues going on, you know, we're dealing with race, we're dealing with climate change, you know, all these crazy things that get perpetuated on social media. Um, and so it is easy to get bogged in that pessimism, but um, I agree that there's a lot of things to be hopeful about. Okay, and so thinking about um, ways in which we message climate change or protection or any type of environmental issues, what do you think would be a more effective way that it will draw the attention of both millennials and Gen Z or just society as a whole? So to Alexa's point, I think sometimes there can be a burnout of, about certain type of issues that we're consistently bombarded with, not that they're not important, but sometimes if the language isn't a certain way, it can be tuned out or you know it just isn't gonna resonate. And so thinking about your peers what would you think would be an effective way to get the message out? So not only are they educated about it, but they're also concerned and potentially want to do something about it. I think not underestimating people's um, thirst for knowledge and their ability to digest large amounts of information. Um, I think potentially as scientists, there are times where we may underestimate the general public's um, appetite for science and their ability to give them certain publications or um, reports from maybe the IPCC um, that we feel like we have to change them. But at least in my experience, discussing people that are maybe outside the field, uh, not only do I introduce it to them, the next time I speak to them, they may have read two, three more things that I hadn't even introduced them. Um, and I think as information becomes more and more readily available, um, it's the best not to underestimate people's uh, appetite to read it themselves. Okay, any other thoughts? I guess to, to show my peers, I, I have had this conversation with my roommates before because I'm always very eco-friendly and here they are not, which is very hard to work with sometimes. So like I have had conversations with them about like climate change and recycling, stuff like that. I think like the easiest way is like to show the like, like YouTube videos, like I show them like, or pictures around the world of like the effects of climate change and even like my like experience firsthand. Cause I always bring up like, I always live by the beach and like every single year I've lived in the same area 
the hurricanes have gotten worse and worse. The flooding has been historical in certain parts of Horry County, as we've seen in like um, a town near me called Conway. Their lake like had historical flooding due to these hurricanes, and it destroyed neighborhoods. So like I see the effects firsthand, and I show them pictures and videos I have took, and they really took in consideration. It's like, wow, it's really affecting her. So maybe I should like look more into it. Okay. Yeah, Jasmine, I feel like you hit the nail on the head that you have to meet people where they're at. And so, you know, talking about a super abstract place like Antarctica is melting might not resonate with someone um, who's living in Louisiana and dealing with their day to day issues, you know, talking about sea level rise, what's really going to impact them, um, you know, kind of matching up impacts with people when you're having conversations. Um, I also love the idea of using visuals. I think sometimes social media can be like, that's a huge pro of it, kind of getting digestible information, like Pam said, in a little graphic or, you know, in a tweet. And there's definitely cons to that too, but um, I like to use that when I'm communicating with people on social media. Okay, any other? Yes. Um, I think that, um, like they all say, try like, you know, advocate them, but also I think like there's already so many issues that kind of takes out the attention to climate change. For example, we can talk about climate change. Um, people would probably talk about it one or two days and then forget about it. So I feel like try to be like committed to, you know, actually like climate change. You guys understand? Mm -hmm. Okay. And definitely the, I'm um, oh, so, sorry, Dr. Warren. Um, oh, no, go ahead. Uh, the, the good thing about climate change is it, it is all around us. So the, the mm -hmm. opportunity for these conversations are endless. Um, and the holistic nature in which climate change affects almost all aspects of life um, means how you can approach these conversations changes. Um, just last year, I was um, diving in Florida and had an opportunity to explain what coral bleaching was, unfortunately, to some of um, uh, some of my dive partners, and again, just back to their their interest, they were asking questions like left, right, and center. I I, I couldn't even answer all of them. They were and and these people didn't have background in um, science, let alone chemical oceanography. But the interest and the appetite and the ability to recognize what the key questions are and how to get that information, I think, was really resonated with me. And it's great that what you're all is saying is that, or to some extent, you're doing the part of educating your peers, whether it's talking to them about the personal effects to yourselves or things that you're seeing that's happening around you or elsewhere. And so I am curious, as you are making your way out into the world, so some of you are actually within your fields, other, others of you are actually working your way through your majors, um, but how do you think you will continue educating individuals around you, especially if you're not necessarily within an environmentally related field? So some of you are in marine science, others aren't, but you can still have that conversation with your family members, with your peers and others. And so how do you think it'll be possible for you to extend this education out into the world? For me, at least, I've always been very vocal about what I think about the environment. I always have been, <laughs> even as a kid, from, like watching Disney Channel to like, like the only reason why I got into recycling this is Disney Channel because like they were pushing out all these recycling efforts, same thing throughout the school, like from like elementary school all the way to high school, they really push recycling and composting and everything for us. So that really stuck with me. And like me doing political science, like I'm really pushing to see if I can do some type of local or state level type politics and like get my foot in the door somewhere and be like an official because I like to help implement some more environmental like plans and like like rulings here in South Carolina like that's something I really want to do like that's like one of my major goals right now I'm only a sophomore so we'll see what happens <laughs> okay um as an international studies major I want to advocate and promote like social justice or and climate change is one of them that I want to do and I feel like taking the initiative like recycling and you know taking care of like the earth people will follow and you know help out hopefully okay yeah. I think for me climate education has been such a huge passion of mine 
And in my job, I don't necessarily get to interact with it on a day-to-day basis, but I've really kind of morphed the goal more into um, I'm helping develop the world's change makers in the marine science and environmental program and setting them up for success to go out and work in carbon capture or go out and work in policy um, and making sure that they have the education to go and do that. And they get to take cool electives like Dr. Z's class or Dr. Warren's class. Um, so I kind of help get to drive the ship in that way, which is really fun. Cool. I think personally, it's, I view these conversations kind of like working out a muscle. So it's better to have a lot of individual smaller conversations, like you work out four or five times a week less than having one massive six hour workout. And then you're just completely gassed for the whole uh, months as it would be for me now post pandemic (laughs) in the middle of pandemic. Um, So I think having these conversations continuously and meeting them as they come up, is very important and doesn't have to be a big three hour seminar, but if an opportunity to discuss it happens and it's a five minute conversation, that's a really successful five minute conversation. And if that five minute conversation happens four or five, six times a week, different times, uh, I think that's much more impactful and resonates with people more as maybe they'll zone out at a bit, um, it's longer kind of seminars. Okay. And so thinking about that, the impact of communications, I'll leave you with this last question. Um, If you were able to do a PSA that goes out globally, so not just to the University of South Carolina or the city of Columbia, but you're able to reach as many people as possible as your last or parting words, what would you share about climate change, climate protection, or the environment in general? So I open it up to whomever wants to go ahead and and end this off. Dr. Warren, that's a loaded question. I know, but you're some intelligent individuals, so I'm looking forward to the answers you're going to provide. The simplest things are so profound, so. Let's see, um, I'll go. Um, I know this summer, a lot of people complain of being a really, really hot summer. To put it in perspective, like, this may be your hottest summer yet, and it's going to be your coldest summer for the rest of your life. So, like, you really have to put this perspective, like, climate change is something that's not going to go away. It's going to happen every single year. There's going to be more hotter and hotter and hotter summers. So we have to take care of our planet because we don't have a backup option. We only have this one planet. We don't have anywhere else to go. So we got to take care of our planets to, like, ensure that, like, we have, like, a planet for our future generations so we can still progress as, like, humans. Okay. Yeah, um. Well, um, I have a question. You guys like water, right? Yes. <laughs> well, and I mean, um, we need to keep like that water safe, like water pollution is becoming a problem and we all love water and it's something we need for life to survive and for future generations. And so uh, if we don't like take, um, if we don't speak out about climate change, then we someday might not have water, you know? Good point. I think for me, this is something I'm quite passionate about is getting people to understand that climate change is for everybody and mitigating climate change is for everybody. It's not just the scientists that do it. It's um, if you're in finance, carbon finance is a super fast and exciting growing industry. Climate change needs uh, business developers. It needs uh, people to speak with people. It needs communications, um, policymakers, uh, accountants, and because it's so massive and it's so interdisciplinary that even if you don't view yourself, oh, I don't have the skills to help. Yes, you do. Everybody can help with something and it's all important and it's going to need everybody. And Alexa, we'll let you take us out. Great. (laughs) Um, Obviously, Kim and I know each other because he stole some of what I was going to say, but I was going to say, yeah, just like having everyone on our team Um, getting as many people as possible because we, you know, I think a lot of time we focus on individual action. So I'm going to go recycle this in my house and we get really bogged down into all those small individual things that we're doing. And we really need to recognize that it's the system that's broken and we're just kind of the cog um, in this system. And it's really forcing these companies and corporations in the world to change and putting pressure on them. 
and um, I'm really excited to see what will happen. Well, those are all great PSAs, and I know that they would definitely make a difference if we were magically able to put it out in the atmosphere. But nonetheless, the things that you are learning, as well as the work that you're doing, is definitely going to have a great impact as far as educating others and just being on the right path to hopefully implementing more changes as it relates to climate change. So I will say for Cameron, Jasmine, Luz, and Alexa, thank you so much for this student, current student as well as alumni roundtable. Um, we thank you for your perspectives. We thank you for everything that you're doing right now, as well as what you're going to be doing in the future. And we do look to you to be the future leaders taking charge when it comes to climate protection. So as Cameron has said, this is very interdisciplinary. So you don't necessarily have to be an environmental scientist or be within the environmental field. You can be within any major and have a significant impact. And so we look forward to seeing you in some type of capacity leading the charge. So thank you very much. Well, I must say I thoroughly enjoyed uh, facilitating that student uh, roundtable, and I really enjoyed hearing um, their messages. And so hopefully we're all encouraged in knowing that the next generation of students as well as graduates are really thinking about the environmental issues and ways in which they can make an impact into the world. Um, as we're starting to wrap up, there has been a lot of great information that has been shared, as well as resources that are going to be available. But before we end out, I do want to share a little bit more about CPAC. And so if there is anyone in the City of Columbia or the Midlands area that would like to get involved and be a part of this great initiative that we're doing, that you can know more about the organization as well as how to get in contact with us. And so I'm going to share a little quickly about the mission of CPAC as well as what we're doing and how you can get in contact with us. And so the mission really is to develop and advocate for effective strategies to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. You heard a little bit, especially during the student uh, roundtable about some of the problems that we're seeing, but we want to put some effective solutions into place. So how can we adapt to climate change in a sustainable way or implement initiatives that will allow us to be effective and do the things that we do need to do within the city, but does not have a major impact on the environment? We also want to conserve, conserve, excuse me, as many natural resources as possible and also do this protection at the city level while also fostering to improve the quality of life for the citizens of the city of Columbia. So we're really led to be solutions driven, finding ways to be an effective city uh, while being sustainable. Now, the purpose of the committee is to really recommend and oversee the development and implementation of mission-based programs and projects that we can bring forth to our leaders, give them a better understanding of why these solutions are going to be important, and help to make decisions on how it's going to be implemented out into the city. Now, if you are interested in being a part of CPAC or being appointed, um, we are at the stage where we're taking applications for both voting as well as non-voting positions. And so you can contact us at the columbiasc.gov backslash departments or DEPTS backslash boards and commissions, and you can get more information. Now, if you're worried or concerned about the time commitment, um, it's a a few meetings that we would do a month. Um, so we have 15 members. There are seven that are voting and there are eight that are non-voting. Non and we do uh, meet twice a month. And so we typically go for about an hour. You would be appointed by city council. So depending on which uh, area you're in, you could be um, nom nominated by one of the council members. Now, if you also choose not to be a member, we do have an advisory council. And so this is made up of individuals, maybe at a, sto a state or local level, or even within organizations in the city in which you can bring a different perspective or information about the things that we're discussing and talking about. So again, if you're interested, because we're at the point where we're trying to bring on new members to bring fresh ideas and solutions for what we're trying to address, then please get in contact with us. And as a very last or a parting 
um, sharing of information. We just want to uh, recap some of the things that we've discussed today. And so as an educator or even as a parent or another citizen that's concerned or wanting to get involved um, on the educational side, we do have the Environmental Education Association of South Carolina or EEASC that you can get in contact with. There's also the Green School, the Green Step Schools program where you can learn more about what is taking place. Or if you're interested in having the program implemented in your school, then you can reach out. We just discussed how you can be involved in the Climate Protection Action Campaign or actually the committee that is facilitating a lot of work. And if you also want to get um, signed up for the uh, Speaking Sustainability Ease newsletter, which provides information um, on what's taking place in Columbia or the Midlands area, you can also get in contact with us that way. So. A lot of great information and resources that has been provided. I want to say thank you for all of the participants that um, were a part of this webinar, both, both live as well as virtually. I want to thank all of you for being a part of this back to school sustainability style uh, webinar. And we look forward to you meeting us again in a few months when we do our final one for the year, sharing information on how you could be informed about things that we're doing in the city of Columbia as it relates to uh, climate protection. Have a great evening and we'll see you at the next webinar.